Maybe just start bluntly with the first question. Who is Leslie Zechariah? Gosh, that, that, that's not an easy question to begin with. Um, uh, le 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 let's see, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a civil engineer. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I come from the Caribbean. Uh, I have a master's in project management. Um, I did my PhD in uh, sustainable architecture. And uh, now I'm living in the Netherlands, married, two children, to a Dutch guy. Um, Can you describe you, because you moved from engineering a little bit more to the, the social a aspects of working together, uh, the, the educational. How did it happen? Well, I started off as an engineer because I thought that that's what my country needed. As a civil engineer, I thought I could build things. Um, and then I, I realized after I got my engineering degree and I was working um, in, a, in a construction company building villas in the Caribbean for very, very rich people that the natives couldn't afford, um, sometimes not doing it in the best way, um, I thought to myself, I want to work on different types of projects. I want to work on projects that, that help development. And the best way probably to do that was to do project management and then to work you know, for something, a World Bank project or something like that for development. Um, so I did my master's in project management and not strictly speaking engineering. And then uh, I was back working with a utilities company and I thought to myself, well, um, we can do a lot of building, but is all the building that we're doing now in the Caribbean the right way to go about it? So I actually started my PhD looking for sustainable building technologies. How can we build and not ruin the environment that we were blessed with. And actually, by the end of my PhD, I thought to myself, and this was already 20 years ago, we have the capacity to build with nature. Why isn't it happening? And then, well, when I, when I moved into a postdoc, I wanted to explore not only the engineering capabilities, but what is preventing the decision making? What is preventing the, the, it from being taken up, all these good engineering ideas? And if you really do a, some analysis, it's, uh, it's, uh, you have to get into the, the economics and the politics and how they balance each other out. Um, the decisions that are taken are sometimes not the, um, let's say, the optimal engineering choices. They're taken for entirely different reasons. And I suppose we as engineers have to be able to speak that language and step into that frame and to be able to understand how we can make um, our ideas, better solutions, yeah, actually be taken up by the decision makers. What I saw, you have a very international background, uh, being uh, born in the West Indies, uh, then studied in Birmingham, uh, went to Toronto, now Technical University in Delft. If you go back, let's say maybe 20 years, 25 years, would you ever have foreseen this adventure? Never. Never. <laughs> Never. Um, I think as a teenager, I didn't even know where the Netherlands was. So um, I think uh, my entire uh, career has been quite, let's say, uh, accidental. I've always been a good student. Uh, it was clear that I wanted, uh, yeah, I, I had some talent there. But uh, for the rest, it's been just uh, picking up the opportunities as they came along. Um, uh, I also didn't have a lot of money to travel, so I tried to pick the universities that I went to strategically, according to who would give me a scholarship, that's number one, and where I'd see some, a different part of the world. So during this whole uh, career up until now, uh, can you remember one or two of the most defining moments of which you okay, this was so important? I work at a university, so I like this, uh, I like this environment a lot. Um, so I sometimes have difficulty separating the part where I'm working and the part where I'm studying. Um, for me, it's all been one uh, <laughs> But can you explain line. on that? Why um, do you have difficulty? Well, I think that, yeah, almost, almost everything you do, you try to wake up every day and um, uh, do something that gives you more choices tomorrow, you know? So uh, you, just, uh, you just try to take advantage of the opportunities as they come along. I was never a person to have a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. I just tried to do the best that I could in what I'm doing now and try to make choices that, you know, set me up for maybe for nicer things uh, later on. I don't think there was a really defining moment in my, 
in my career path. I think that sometimes things didn't work out the way I planned. Like I had applied to go to MIT and I applied for a scholarship. And um, I can remember reading the letter that said, no, sorry, we can't give you any money. And that for me is the same as saying you can't come because I was from a developing country. And sort of on a whim, then, I decided to uh, go study to do my master's in England because they were giving me a scholarship. And I said, oh, why not? It's one year out of my life. I'll do it and see. And it was one of the best years of my life. That's so actually you accepted where... <laughs> it? Yeah. How it just happened? Yeah. And uh, it turned out to be one of the best years of my life. Because why? I met my husband when I was in England studying. I met some of the best friends, graduated top of my class, which led me to me getting a scholarship to do my PhD. So that year was, uh, yeah. Maybe you could say that was a defining uh, year in my life. But it happened quite accidentally, and it came out of a disappointment. If you talk about disappointment, um, obviously everybody uh, struggles sometimes as difficult uh, periods. Um, what are the key disappointments which you had to overcome to be uh, who you are now? Um. I must say I'm very fortunate. I didn't have very many, but perhaps maybe it's too because I set my expectations in a very realistic way. I've had a lot of support, and although, as I said, I come from a developing country, I'm, uh, I, we didn't have a lot, um, I was just trying to find you know, ways to, to get to a next step. Um, sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't work, but I tried not to, um, yeah, not to dwell on, the, on the, the things that didn't work, but to try to see an opportunity to go a different way. If you work with passion, there is no work pressure. <laughs> I, I disagree. I disagree. Um, in everything, you have to seek balance. And sometimes you have to step away from your passion in order to get new perspective and to come back with renewed energy. Explain. That's just, I think, just a fact of life. You, if you keep going and keep going and keep going, there's the danger of becoming, of, of getting into a sort of tunnel where you only see what's in front of you. Um, you have to step back. You have to take the overview. You have to get different, uh, different uh, perspectives. And sometimes that comes not when you're plugging away at your computer, but when you're on a walk and then you see something differently. Things fall into place differently. And that's important. Those insights are even important for your passions. Hi, I'm Leslie Zachariah. I'm the Secretary General of the Idea League, and that is an alliance of five top technical universities in Europe. The TU Delft is one, but also there's uh, ETH Zurich, uh, RWTH Aachen, Chalmers University of Technology, and Politecnico di Milano. And these five universities are working together, trying to inspire each other to innovate.